this episode of The Dog Show, I speak with Zubin Bete. Zubin is the co-founder and CEO of Fuzzy Pet Health. Now, Fuzzy is a subscription-based pet health company that provides everything your pet needs to live longer, healthier, and happier lives, including preventative meds, virtual access to vets, and much more. In the interview, we discuss pet longevity, including a range of simple things you can do to extend your dog's life and enhance their well-being. Uh, Zubin, welcome to The Dog Show. Thanks very much for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. Excited to chat. Great, yeah. So let's start by hearing a bit more about your dog, Mo. Uh, what type of dog is it? Yeah, Mo's a little black Cocker Spaniel. She's uh, going on eight years old now. She was the runt of a litter, um, was kind of abandoned on the side of the road, which is why we um, were fortunate enough to get to rescue her. Um, uh, I'll give you a little bit more on her. She is a scavenger. She is always battling with weight issues. Uh, she's always getting into trouble, whether it be uh, fighting with skunks or raccoons. And uh, yesterday she managed to get us into a fight with a cacti. So <laughs> um, when you say she's battling with weight issues, is she overweight, underweight? Yeah, o- overweight. She's a scavenger. So she'll just get into, she's super food motivated. She'll okay. try and get into all kinds of food. We're We're good now. We learned um, less than the hard way that uh, we couldn't leave any food lying around anywhere in the house because somehow, even though she's not really much more than a foot tall, mm. um, she was able to get on top of dinner tables and coffee tables and, <laughs> and into all sorts. So um, we have a few stories of her getting into anything from chocolates to um uh what what else big bags full of uh supplements that were way too rich for her so ended up having some uh stomach issues there uh and probably a few other things too yeah that's crazy is she an inside dog does she stay inside most of the time or uh for the most part yeah she she stays she sleeps indoors but uh we're lucky we have a garden where she gets to roam around and be active in um in we we have a it's impossible for her to get out get out so she won't be outside in in the road or anything like that but um she i'd say that she's an inside dog she also okay. spends a lot of our time pre covid she spent a lot of her time in our office so she was surrounded by other dogs uh or humans that were very very happy to spoil her and feed her treats okay cool um is there anything about the cocker spaniel which is unique or um, I'm always interested to hear about different dog breeds and, and, you know, you only really hear about subtle things when you actually speak to an owner that's got one. Um, so apparently they're water dogs, so they, they love the water and uh, we, we take her to the beach, uh, try and do it a couple of times a week and she'll just, it can be freezing cold. And I, I don't know if you know much about San Francisco and how cold <laughs> the water is, is over here, but mm. it's cold. Uh, and she'll just run into the water no matter how cold it is and, and just love swimming around. So um, that's probably one thing. Her breed is predisposed to um, like ear. They've got big, floppy, hairy ears, right? And mm. so her breed is predisposed to ear infections. But fortunately, we've kind of found ways to make sure that, that doesn't happen. And we haven't had one for about four years now. Um, so, and interestingly, I don't know if this is a Cocker Spaniel thing, but she is super cuddly, very affectionate, likes her independence too, but she's not that much of a fan of babies and kids. She right. probably, I think she feels fairly intimidated by something that's, that's the same height as her. Right. Okay. I guess at eight years old as well, maybe she's, has she always been that way or maybe she's just becoming a bit more grumpy as she gets older? She's, no, she's always been like that. Okay. Um, yeah. So. Maybe she is also getting more grumpy. Who knows? <laughs> um, have you have you ever had any other dog breeds, or would you say cocker spaniels is your favourite dog breed? Uh, um, so I had Rottweilers. Uh, oh wow, uh, it's a bit uh, of a difference. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, I, I'm from South Africa, and in South Africa we have bigger dog breeds, and so a Rottweiler and a Bourbon, uh, which is a South African breed. Um, uh, Rottweiler Tessa was the gentlest of beasts, always thought she was a lap dog and super loving. Mm-hmm. Um, they get a bad rep, um, which is unfortunate, but they're just super um, smart and very affectionate, pretty, um, 
dogs and also the cutest puppies. And then our first dog, uh, we also had a golden retriever, and our first dog as a family was a dog called Tiger, which was a mixed breed. He was the smartest dog that you could imagine. And when I speak about kind of getting, um, having a gate and having access to the roads, Tiger had a, um, a roaming range of about five miles radius. And so he would, he'd be seen in downtown Cape Town, which was about five miles away from us and just roaming around. And then obviously he'd always come back home every night, but, uh, he just had a big roaming radius, uh, and a super smart dog. So yeah, we've had a big mix. I hear I hear wonderful things about Cape Town, like the landscapes and stuff. I kind of it's one it's one place on my bucket list I'd love to love to see. I'm a little bit cautious, I guess, because I don't know a lot about South Africa in terms of like I've never been there, but it sounds like a beautiful place. I'm biased, uh, but it, Cape Town is, in my mind, the most beautiful city in the world. You have beautiful beaches, unbelievable uh, landscape with Table Mountain, mm. um, and then Winelands close by, but. Just generally a beautiful place, great people. Um, I mean, South Africa as a country is grappling with some societal issues as a whole. Mm. But uh, uh, being, being from Australia uh, and, and following a game of cricket, there's, there are few be- better places to watch a game of cricket than Newlands cr- Cricket Ground. Yeah, I can imagine that would be, that'd be nice. I think there's a lot of similarities with the climate actually in South Africa and Australia. Maybe that's what draws me to it. Um, yeah. yeah, great yeah. surf too. Yeah. Cool. So let's t- talk about Fuzzy. Uh, so Fuzzy Pet Health is your business um, and it's dedicated to making vet care more accessible to people all across the United States using technology. So you've got an app, you've got the website where people can sign up for your subscription service. Um, what got you into this industry? Obviously, you're a dog lover for years, but what kind of got you, led you down the path of working in the, the vet care industry? Yeah, nothing in my career uh, spoke to me moving into the pet industry. Um, my background is in technology uh, and started off at Xerox and then ended up going into marketing software or mobile software um, and mobile networks. So I I found myself working in the industry because of my dog, Mo. Uh, I ended up having to rush her into an emergency vet clinic one day and found the experience of getting veterinary care pretty challenging, uh, long waiting room visits, uh, long waiting room uh, wait times, um, eventually seeing veterinarians, incredibly high cost of care. Uh, I think anyone that's a pet parent uh, at some point has uh, witnessed or experienced a, uh, a shock veterinary bill. Yeah. And um, we realized that there was an opportunity to use technology to be able to make um, exceptional veterinary care more accessible to folks. I think data already proves that more proactive care in human health leads to a longer lifespan for us humans. The same thing applies to uh, to pets. We're all hearing about this humanization of pets. Our pets are now our kids, uh, and we're treating them like uh, part of the family. Uh, and them being living beings, the same thing rings true, where if you're treating them in the right way and you're being proactive about the level of care that you're able to deliver to them, then you can almost double a pet's lifespan. And just think about that, right? If you, if, what, what would you do, what would you give to double your pet's lifespan? And um, it isn't uh, that inconceivable to fathom. So we believe that there's a path to be able to do that. Yeah, I imagine that's probably the dream of, of all dog owners, <laughs> to be able to double their pet's lifespan. Um, cause the thought of, yeah, the thought of losing, you know, the, the, your best friend and the one that you love, um, is, is, you know, hard to deal with if you're, if you're a new pet owner. So um, one question I had about the way your service works, like for example, I mean, I, I, what I understand you can get on demand kind of, uh, advice from vets, um, so online or through the app or, or whatever it is, but so, for example, I had an emergency situation. So, let, let's say my dog's eating something, and I'm not sure about whether it's going to be, you know, potentially harmful to them. So, I jump on Fuzzy and try to get some advice. What would yeah. the next step be? What would happen from there? It really does depend, and that's essentially why uh, we designed the service in the way that we did. So, we we are focused on the longe- longevity of pets. We also are focused on doing that through better access to care. So. I think every pet parent has had this moment where your dog's eaten something or it's behaving funny or something is up. And Mm. unfortunately, a lot of the time that happens late at night 
or at, at a time where it's difficult to be able to um, contact your veterinarian. And even sometimes you'll be calling up your veterinary clinic and the first thing they're saying to you is come in and we'll be able to give you, um, give you an answer. And so no pet parent wants to be the irresponsible pet parent um, and people want to be able to make the right decision as relates to their pet's health. But the moment you go into an emergency vet clinic, you're out of pocket for a couple of hundred dollars at the minimum. Um, so for us, we believe that uh, a digital interface means that we're more accessible than ever before to be able to get expert information and advice from a veterinarian. So you hop into your website or you hop into our app, you initiate a consult um, or, or start chatting with our team. And as you start chatting with our team, our team will be able to get uh, some information. So what was ingested? What is the volume? Typical things are like chocolate or um, or gum or medications mm. or some some incorrect food type that could be toxic. So what was ingested? What was the volume that was ingested? We go through some calculations and then essentially that's a basic triage. So that basic triage is, yes, this is something that shouldn't have happened, but you're okay. Your pet will be fine. You've got to wait this one out with them. It will take 12 to 24 hours. We'll continue to check in over that period of time. And at that point, the pet parent kind of feels this sense of safety or um, security that they've gone to seek out advice, they've got expert advice, and they've made the right decision. Mm. There will certainly be instances where um, the pet has ingested something that shouldn't be, shouldn't have been ingested. Uh, and that then means that um, we will refer them into a veterinary clinic if there is a need for further treatment. Um, and that clinic could be a full service vet clinic. It could be an emergency clinic. It could also even be a veterinarian coming to their home. Um, it really does depend on the actual type of care that your pet needs. The other example that I'll give is sometimes people are out in the middle of nowhere, right? Mm -hmm. And they're hours away from the closest veterinarian. So they'll hop into um, our interface and they'll start engaging with our team. And at times they'll have to say, I don't have access to a veterinarian. What can you do to help me treat for this today? Um, and there's certainly some opportunities and some treatments that can be provided by our veterinarians. I'm not a veterinarian, so I'm not going to walk through those specifically today. Hmm. But um, in those instances, there certainly are things that can be done to help support a pet parent to navigate through um, the actual need at that point in time. Yeah, that must be a huge benefit. I guess I took it for granted. I live in the city, so you know, if I needed to see an emergency vet, there's one you know within. 15 minutes max if I needed to need to see one. But in remote areas, it must be much more challenging. So having access to that expert advice. I mean, there's, there's a lot of advice on the internet and stuff which, you know, give or take, you don't know where it's coming from. But if you can actually get direct, a direct line to a vet, it sounds hugely beneficial. What you spoke about earlier is like doubling the life of your pet. And I'm sure every owner wants to hear about how it's possible to do little things day to day or... Um, you know, in, in their lifestyle, which can help extend the life of their dog. So what, um, what, what can people do to, to extend the life of their dog? Yeah, I, I think the key thing that we're, that we're looking at um, is pet health has for a long time um, kind of dovetailed what the research, because there's, there's a minimal amount of research done or, or less research done in animal health than there is done in human health. And so a lot of the research from human health can be brought down into, uh, into how we care for our pets and how we can extend the lifespan of, of our pets. And the key drivers around um, extension of life in humans are what do you eat, how are you keeping fit, and what are the proactive things that you're doing to stay healthy, right? And so like nutrition obviously is key. Um, act activity and exercise is key. And then what are the things that you do on a daily or weekly basis to stay healthy. And actually, one of the most interesting things that I hear from most veterinarians is keep your pet active, brush their teeth, clean their uh, their skin, right? Um, those are three of the simplest things to do, but actually also high leverage. Um, it's incredible how much of an impact keeping your pet's teeth clean are, because that's where everything's being ingested, and it actually has a direct um, impact on the internal organs of the pet. Interesting. So when when you say cleaning your teeth, are you physically cleaning their teeth or are they, are they doing dental chews? What, uh, maybe both? I don't know. 
bet, best practice from veterinarians is to say, hey, if you can brush once a day, awesome. If you're brushing any less than three times a week, uh, then you're actually not doing anything. You're not even touching the sides because the tartar buildup actually is then begun and you're not really getting rid of all the tartar buildup and it just continues to build up. So um, ideally what you're doing is brushing three to four times a week and also supplementing that with things like dental chews. You got to look for the dental chews that have the right accreditations too. There's the, um, I, uh, it, uh, it's, I'm blanking on it right now, but there is an organization that actually vets what the right products are and um, and get their, gets, gives the right accreditations. Uh, and those are the ones that are going to be most efficacious. Okay, interesting. Um, what was it? Sorry, what was the third part you said? So obviously exercise, um, dental health, and then and nutrition. Nutrition. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Forget. What do you feed your dog? Right. And what what do you feed your dog? And how much do you feed your dog? So the key thing is, I mentioned when I explained my dog that um, she kind of has weight issues. For <laughs> yeah. for us, it's just something that we measure so much, and I and I'm very conscious of it. In that. Um, Dogs and cats have something called, and veterinarians use something called a BCS to, me- to measure dogs and cats, similar to a BMI in humans. And it goes on a scale of one to nine, right? And so the ideal is four to five. Um, ideally, four is perfect. And um, there, there's data, there's studies out there that actually show that if you're at a six or seven, it's really impacting the quality of life of your pets. And so the reason why we started Fuzzy is because uh, my dog has issues with something called luxating patella, where her knee, um, her kneecap basically is shifting um, inside to out. It's something that's very common in small breeds, and I believe in Frenchies too, right? So um, the issue is, is that if she's overweight, that weight is putting more stress on her bones and joints. If, um, if that's putting more stress on her bones and joints, there's a high likelihood that by the time she gets to, let's say, 12 or 13 years old, um, she is able to walk less. And then it basically just has an impact on the amount of activity. And if it's having an impact on the amount of activity, then that will impact the amount that she's able to eat because she's not able to keep her weight. So it's all interconnected. Um, but ideally, you want to keep your pet at the right, uh, the right weight and the right um, body mass index or BCS, body condition score, they call it. Uh, and essentially that will, uh, help prolong your pet's life. And most importantly is, um, optimize their quality of life too. Mm -hmm. Uh, You don't want your pet to be, I, I, for me, for instance, I I remember having a conversation with our veterinarian saying, uh, where they said she, she's healthy for the most part, but do you want your dog to be 12 or 13 years old and have to have wheels on her back legs, um, for her to be able to get around? And I mean, obviously, we all know the answer to that, right? So we're trying to mitigate that um, and help her live as long as possible. Yeah, the, the luxating patella is a it's a sad one to say. Our, our Frenchie does sometimes, um, ha, like ha, she has basically loose patellas or loose knees, as I call them. But <laughs> um, sometimes when walking, like you'll notice that it'll just pop out or whatever it does, and like they'll start to hop a little bit. And yeah. it happens every now and then for her, so it hasn't got to the point where it's like a, a big issue. But you know, I can imagine weight management's a huge thing. Actually, I had um, Ronaldo Webb from Pet Plate on the show. I think I, I can't remember. I saw your both of your your photos on on the same um, event somewhere when I was researching for the show. But he was talking about how important the uh, measurement of food is, and which is kind of what you hinted towards as well. Um, cool. So, there are there any common mistakes that you think owners make when it comes to ex- like short? I guess shortening the life of their of their dog. So we talk about extending it, but there's probably some day-to-day things people might do that they think is, you know, is harmless or not really doing, doing too much, but it could be having a long-term contribution to the, the shortening of the life. Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, I would say for the most part, it's um, lack of properly vaccinating your pets, um, lack uh, or overfeeding, uh, like, I think it's something like 68% of pets are obese. So, I mean, if you and obesity has direct link to kidney uh, or heart issues. Um, so that obviously shortens the lifespan of our pets for sure. Uh, and then um, a lack of proactive care for things like ear infections or eye infections or skin infections. And unfortunately, a lot of that is actually driven by the friction that's involved in veterinary care. So... 
uh, I mean, we, we as a company offered in-home veterinary care, right? Like the most low friction type of care that you can have. You sit back, have someone knock on your door, a veterinarian comes in and delivers care to your pet. As simple as that, you, you're sipping on a glass of wine while it's happening or, or having a beer. And even then, there was still friction involved in getting that veterinary care and there's cost involved. So what people do is they end up putting it off for a very, very long time. Mm. And so I'll give you a perfect example. The number of folks that come in through our telehealth um, consults where they speak about allergies that lead to skin infection. So if you treat the allergy, you won't get the skin infection, which means that you don't need to provide your pets antibiotics, which means that you don't kind of um, limit their, their health. Or in cats, UTIs, urinary tract infections, that um, create blockages that actually lead to more, uh, a significant amount, a non-trivial number of deaths in cats. Um, but they don't know if it's something that is an issue, so they hold off until it's something that's so severe that they then have to go into a veterinary clinic and they're then faced with a bill of thousands of dollars. But actually, you could have addressed for it for a very small amount if it was dealt with preventively. So putting off healthcare, um, overfeeding, and proper vaccination and uh, treatment of, and preventive treatment um, of illnesses. Yeah, the, if I was to summarize what you just said then, it sounds like taking steps to prevent, I guess, bigger issues is what you're suggesting. And I, I can relate to the allergy thing. So our French Bulldog has um, both food and environmental allergies. And just just an example of what, you know, that doesn't sound like to, to the average person, probably doesn't sound like much, but it can result in, in so many things. As you said, skin infections, um, you know, swollen pores, um, infections in all sorts of like nooks and crannies and crevices in their body and their wrinkles in their tail in all sorts of areas right um yeah. and then from the, a food perspective they can get you know um gastro issues if they're eating the wrong food so by doing small things like you mentioned like managing the allergies day to day with medication um and f uh, feeding them the right amount of food and you know, the right types of food and everything like that that can prevent needing you know, a, a big vet bill where they might need to stay overnight or, or whatever else. So, yeah, preventive care will save the average pet parent uh, seven and a half thousand dollars through the course of the life of their pet. Just yeah. preventive care, just doing the things day to day. We, um, I'll, I'll give you an example. We, I was chatting with our veterinary team just this morning, and we had a patient that came in where the dog had uh, their had skin allergies mm. um, and was then chewing their paw to a point where the paw was swollen and then bleeding mm. um, and then needed to go into a veterinary clinic and their bill was three and a half thousand dollars yeah um, to address for something uh, and all it would have taken was uh, antihistamine or proper allergy treatment preventively and it would have totally eliminated that yeah um, I, I love what you said it is relate earlier in the in the interview about relating it, um, the progression of dog health to human health. And I think it's something that is a common theme I'm, I'm noticing through a lot of the interviews I'm doing for, the, for this podcast is that dog, everything to do with pets and dogs is kind of a little bit behind what humans are at, but they, we can learn a lot from, from that progression and just yeah. concentrating on, you know, the simple stuff, right? Exercise, um, you know, dental health and, and diet and everything like that. It sounds like you know, it's, it's simple, but a lot of dog owners may not think about, you know, those simple things as well. I think we're starting to become more in tune with it. If you think about the people that are now adopting or getting pets, mainly millennials that are first time pet parents, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what we found, I don't know, I, I grew up with pets all along, but when we got Mo, I remember being like, oh, there's this living thing that I'm now <laughs> responsible for. What do I feed her? What am I supposed to do with her poop? Where? What's her daily schedule like? Am I treating her in a way that's going to keep her healthy? Is she happy, right? Like, if you think back to kind of 15, 20 years, that human-animal bond or even the thought about is my pet happy didn't really factor into the, the, the realm of conversation all that much. And now we're starting to see more of that. And so there's similar trends that we're starting to see that have been brought from, and, and the gap is um, is closing in the time taken from innovations to go from human into uh, into pet. But um, in human, we were looking at DNA kits a while ago and how our DNA can help inform things like allergies or genomics or other things that could help uh, us live longer. Um, the things like diet and how do we think smarter about our diets um, and, and how that can help us live a healthier life. 
Uh, and then people talk about the mind gut connection too and human health. There are things like um, activity and um, and regular regularity of activity. So even if it is just getting 10 to 15 minutes a day, um, getting your pet out and giving giving them that kind of sensory um, exposure is a really positive um, indicator to their quality of life and their health longer term. And so what I think we'll see is a continued, and, and nutrition is another version of that, right? Like you, you mentioned pet plate, on the cat side, there's smalls, there's companies like um, Ollie and the farmer's dog and Nom Nom now too. Um, and so we're seeing people become a lot more conscious about what we're feeding our pets, how we're caring for them, the level of activity that they have, and the healthcare that we're providing to them to really extend their lifespan. So all the things that we are doing for ourselves, we're trying to find ways to be able to do that for our pets, because that's part of that humanization of, uh, of pets in our world. Zubin, thanks so much for um, all the fantastic advice you've given today about extending a dog's life. Um, I think there's some really valuable takeaways there for, for owners that are looking to just increase the well-being and health of their dogs and, and have them for longer. So um, where can people find out more about Fuzzy and what you're doing and what, what would it look like if I was a new a dog owner that wanted to sign up for Fuzzy? Yeah, uh, our website tells you uh, a lot about the products that and services that we make available. So in a nutshell, we are a telehealth platform that includes tools to keep track of essential pet health information, such as you can track your weight in our app, you can track your pet's weight and nutrition, food intake, their skin health, their energy. So you can track all of these things on a day-to-day -day basis and actually then see trends over time and use that as an indicator about your pet's well-being and, uh, and their, their, their life and quality of health. So go into our website, create a profile, download the app, um, get access to our telehealth services, chat live with our veterinary team, um, and, and start taking a proactive um, view uh, and capturing data along that journey of your pet's health and well-being. Perfect. Well, I'll include all the links to your website and the app store as well in, in the show notes. Sounds great. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me on here. It's great to, great to be a part of the show. It's been great to have you. Thanks so much.